Great. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our last webinar on climate change in Penang uh, uh, topic. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, today we have three distinguished uh, panelists uh, who will share with us uh, how we can protect our water uh, and also our biodiversity in, in Penang. So they are Professor Dr. Anwar Azazi Zakaria, who is the Director of Engineering Campus and also Director of River Engineering and Drainage Research Center, or REDAC, uh, at USM. Uh, our second panelist is Dr. Abe Wu. He is the Senior Lecturer at Center for Marine and Coastal Studies, also uh, from USM. And last but not least, we have Dr. Ahmed Zafir, who is the Head of Education, Research and Training at uh, the Habitat Foundation. And thank you so much for joining us, uh, 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 Professor and, and Doctors. And we are looking forward to um, being enlightened uh, you know, by, by your presentation. So before we begin, just a few sort of housekeeping rules for everyone out there. And um, if you are disconnected, don't worry, you know, keep calm and just log back in. We will still be here. And when the whole, when, during the whole session, can you please make sure that you are muted and your video is not showing so that we have a good connection and there's no disruption uh, during the presentations. And we'll be sending uh, the PowerPoint of all three panelists to all of you who have registered with us. And the, the session will, is all, will also be recorded and be put on a PGC's YouTube uh, uh, page after uh, the, the webinar. So um, I think that's pretty much uh, the housekeeping rule. So again, you know, if you're disconnected uh, or if we are disconnected, don't worry, just sign, sign back in. So yeah, uh, before we, I, I pass uh, it on to Professor Azazi who will be talking to us about protecting uh, Penang's rivers and how do we use our rivers potentially and also storm water uh, as an alternative water source. I just want to give, I just want to give an overall sort of a context of what are the water issues that we're facing in Penang. And, and some of you might have heard it somewhere else before. There had been a lot of webinars on our water challenges in Penang, but for those who have not come across this topic, I just want to give a, a very brief context just to, not to scare you, but to sort of uh, paint a realistic picture of where we are at with our water. So first of all, fact, and this might come as a shock to, to a lot of you, is Penang is not uh, really a water secure state because 80% of our drinking water comes from Sungai Muda, which obviously originates from Kuda, so which means that we don't really have control over our uh, the activities uh, taking place taking place in upstream of the river. Uh, things like logging, for example, will threaten our water supply. And on top of that, as we have seen in our uh, previous webinar, especially the first webinar where we uh, sort of sort of uh, uh, discussed about the climate change impact in Penang, we see that. Uh, uh, climate change with a drone, longer dry spell, with uh, erratic rainfall, will cause a lot of problems for our water supply. So we have, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you can, you can see that if you go to PBA website, a lot of our dams level are very low, uh, much lower than before. So if with, with climate change, it sort of uh, amplifies our uh, th the threats. And if something happens, if the level of Sumamura goes down. And we are pretty much, you know, we're pretty sure that Kuda will try to reserve the water for its people. So whether or not we will get enough downstream uh, for Penang, we don't know. And also not just the dry, uh, uh, not just drought and dry periods, but also flood. Flood events and sea level rise that will hit Penang. It will disrupt our water treatment facilities. It will, it will you know, disrupt uh, sewage treatment that will sort of uh, maybe pollute our, our waterways and pollute our pipes and, and, and so on. So these floods and sea level rise will also pose uh, uh, threats to our water, to supply of clean water. And I think to make things worse, water is not uh, valued appropriately in Penang. We have the nation's lowest water tariff uh, for domestic water. For example, I think most of you are paying maybe five ringgit for two months use of water, you know, which is extremely, extremely low, which is like half the price of uh, Starbucks coffee, for example. 
and not uh, surprisingly, we have the highest domestic water consumption per capita per, uh, per day in the whole of Malaysia. So that alone, you know, sort of tells us that we do not value our water enough and to most um, members of the public, we don't have an issue with water. That was captured by a survey done by USM uh, two, three years ago, where, where the public were asked about, you know, what are the main concerns that you see that Penang will face uh, going forward. Water was ranked really, really low because, because water is so cheap. People don't see that it is a, a scarce resource. People think that, you know, every time you turn on the pipe, PBA will do the magic and, and send us water, but it's, that's not the case. So low water tariff means uh, wasteful behavior, but importantly, it also discourages inv investment in new technologies with, uh, for recycling water, for saving water, for example. And we, it's, all not, it's not all doom and gloom. We have a very capable uh, institution, the PBAPP, the Water Board, which is an award-winning institution under the leadership of Dr. Do Jasini. They have worked very hard and they also they always try their best to make sure that we are supplied with safe and clean water without disruption because that is this uh, sort of uh, mandate given to them by the government that there's no rationing. So they, they try that, their, their best to provide us with the clean water every day. But there's a limit to what they can do. They can't create fresh water out of nowhere. And PBA has you know, consistently told the public that we will be facing water shortage by 2025, so like five years from now. If no action is taken, uh, this is because of increased population and the lack of alternative water sources. So the, the water that we are treating, get, uh, withdrawing now from Sungai Muda will not be able to meet the demand of P9 by 2025 if nothing else uh, takes place. So PBA, to, to overcome this issue, PBA has come up with a, a long-term plan uh, until 2050 of what are the possible things that they will do, uh, including building a new treatment plant so that we can draw more water from Sungai Muda to, to, to treat. And there's also this Sungai Perak Rural Water Transfer Scheme that PBA has been discussing with federal government for ages, for years and years, but no sort of uh, uh, no agreement has been uh, arrived at. So we are still sort of hanging out there. We don't know when we can uh, get water from Sungai Perak. And there's also a plan for desalination plant, We're building a desalination plant at the south of the island. So these are solutions, possible solutions, but they are also potentially costly solutions, especially the desalination plant, which is very energy intensive and also costs a lot of money. You know, eventually, if you adopt these costly solutions, it will push up the water tariff anyway. So we might as well increase our water tariff now, right? So that we can encourage more uh, uh, water saving behavior from, from users. And, and importantly, we can also promote water saving technologies because as, uh, we know sort of cutting down water demand is actually the cheapest solution. So if you don't need that much water, they don't have to spend a lot of money building new installations and keep providing us with sort of uh, water that we just waste anyway. So installing water, device, saving, water saving devices, water recycling, rainwater harvesting, for example, and also perhaps cleaning up our rivers so that we can get more of the fresh water supply for rivers uh, like Sungai Pride, for example, there is some capacity to deliver some, uh, to provide some volume of uh, water supply for Penang. But at the moment, our rivers are too polluted and they are not for, for water use. So one of our um, panelists today, Professor Azazi, will discuss that possibility. Can we clean our rivers? Can we collect our storm water as a potential source of uh, uh, water supply? So this is, I, I hope that uh, this has given a, a, a very sort of uh, rudimentary picture to you of what are the challenges that we are facing in terms of water. And we put water and biodiversity in the same uh, group because there is this interconnection. When, for example, when it comes to rivers, if we can't clean our rivers, we protect our river ecosystem, uh, we uh, then give us an alternative source of water supply. So as I, as I said before, we hope that, you know, this last webinar uh, in our P climate change in P9 series will sort of trigger some thoughts, uh, some uh, uh, new ideas or some urge to take action. 
but anyway, well, that, that's all the sort of the context that I would like to uh, give to the audience. And without delaying much more, I will pass it on to, I'll pass the button to Professor Azazi. Professor Azazi, uh, please, you can, you may start your presentation and start your uh, screen sharing. And also, sorry, one last uh, reminder, we take questions. So there will be a Q&A session after the three presentations where we will be uh, asking question, uh, panelists questions. So please write your question in the chat box and we'll be collecting them throughout the, the whole session. Thank you. Professor Azazi, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ang Shinwi, uh, for inviting me uh, to join the discussion uh, through webinar today. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> Very good morning to all audience that managed uh, to join us today. So topic uh, given uh, to me today is technically <clears throat> to look into the possibility of using Penang's rivers. You know, there are a few river systems in Penang, including Sungai Pinang and store water management as a new uh, water supply for us. So uh, technically, I will start with some issue on uh, water security in Malaysia, which is similar to what we have in Penang. So there are four uh, main issues, uh, three on technical and one on governance, as you can see on the screen right now. So of course, flooding is because too much rain coming just like the event in Selangor and Kuala Lumpur you know, for the last uh, last week, I think. Then, of course, uh, the Shingwe already, already mentioned, you know, about the river pollution, uh, water scarcity, uh, but not mentioning about governance issue that uh, I'm, I'm going to cover today. So, technically, uh, we have so much uh, water resource uh, from the rainfall in average of 2,500 millimeter a year. And this number is uh, technically is about 4.5 times more than the world average. So based on this, sometimes we have so much water and due to the climate change, the pattern of rainfall changing, it's not supposed to be rain in Wilayah Puskutuan and KL now, but uh, it will do, uh, this, I think it's supposed to be in Penang, you know, uh, like we have a wet season now. Uh, but somehow rather the climate change has changed everything, made ourselves very difficult uh, to settle this. Okay, uh, before I go further, let me introduce myself. I'm from, I'm the founding uh, for this uh, research center called REDAC about 20 years ago. So now we offer four master and PhD degree uh, for these four areas and this is our activity. You know, uh, the main of our activity right now is more on the consultancy and research contract for both government and uh, developer uh, throughout the country. Uh, in 2014, based on our performance and uh, research uh, dominant in water security, we have accredited in the uh, Ministry of Higher Education as one of the four high SUE in USM. And we become the first uh, high SUE in uh, service trust, you know. Uh, the rest are research trust in USA. Uh, then there are another five more uh, service trust in Malaysia right now. There are about 20 uh, high SUE in the country. Uh, probably by end of this month or early next, early next month, uh, there will be announcement about a new UNESCO Chair on eco hydraulic for Sustainable Water Infrastructure for SDG C in Asia and Pacific region. So myself and Rida has been awarded uh, this uh, chair, you know, for the next four years. And this is our, our program later on. So probably uh, based on the governance issue, uh, this is probably the way forward, you know, how to settle uh, the main issue uh, in Malaysia. Technically, we have so many technical people uh, in Malaysia who can handle and then uh, know how to settle the current problem that we have as far as the water security is concerned. But technically, we have 
so much or so many ministry involved uh, in water resources. You know, so technically there are some uh, association like UNESCO need to come across to probably uh, prepare the ministry meeting uh, to address the water issue. Uh, furthermore, we have problems like what she said, Penang, although this is the lowest tariff in the country, but is the highest using, you know, the, the, the highest user of the water consumption as far as domestic is concerned. So technically, it's confirmed by Malaysia Water Association. If you see uh, in the slide now, uh, if you combine these three elements, you know, the one from toilet, car washing, gardening and whatnot, uh, plus leak from the tap, it's more than 50% of water has, has been used, you know, uh, wrong water uh, for the right reason. That's what I always mention. So we have to flush our toilet daily every time we enter, but technically we don't have uh, non-potable water in our building, you know. Uh, throughout the country, this is the way uh, we have designing our building now. And this needs to be changed, you know. We need to use the water, the non-treated water, because the issue is not the total water that coming. The main issue is the capacity of water treatment in all uh, water company in the country. This is the main issue. Uh, as far as Penang is concerned, there are uh, what they call this uh, Penang Green Agenda 2018 and 2030 that already launched by CM, I think. So technically, uh, out of four teams, two teams are definitely involved with some of water resources issue here. Yeah. Team number one and team number four. However, to, to use the water from Penang River system, this is uh, the quality of water that we are looking for. At least they are supposed to be in class two or the worst is class three before they can be treated. If they fall into class four or five, technically you cannot use that water because treatment plan will have to, to we will cost so much, you know, on treatment plan. So technically for uh, current situation, river in Penang are in very bad shape. So technically, uh, we have few river system like, like, you know, this is slide from the ID, you know, the, 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 they show here, this is a Penang River system. I will show you a great detail. This is in, in, in Barat Daya. So there are a few more river system. There are two similar names of Sunga Pinang. One uh, to go to the left, one to go to the right. But normally people know Sunga Pinang as the one from Georgetown. Uh, as far as uh, Penang River is concerned, when we want to use the, 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 the water from Penang River, we need to look into uh, some issue here. So I have managed uh, to take some uh, information from the website, you know. So technically, as far as year to 2000, uh, most of these river are under class five, you know, on the national water quality standard. But now, Penang State Government has claimed that by 2000, 2006, 60% of Penang River uh, was at class two. So hopefully this is true, that hopefully we can manage or probably uh, continue uh, to have uh, this condition. However, uh, based on 2019 uh, statement, you know, uh, from the website, you can see that, you know, some of the issue are still remain there. And this is uh, from Bernamo. If you see, you know, out in, in the mainland of Penang, uh, we have this current problem, you know, uh, whether we want to go through into our, to continue our, what you call this, uh, uh, food activity and then uh, ignore uh, the water resource issue or we need to be balanced, you know, uh, for this reason. So technically, if this continue, how can we take this color of water uh, to become our drinking water? So I'm taking one slide also from Penang Water Wash here. Uh, if we see that, River, uh, Penang River system, you know, Sunga Penang, for example, when we take from upstream, Sunga Aitrejong, for example, one of the tributary, uh, this is very, very clean, you can see. But later on, go to the midstream, you can see the color change, and then later on, you will see that 
uh, this is not good. So technically, it's become from class one, they have changed into class four or five. So if this is continue, so technically, what we want to achieve uh, definitely is not there. That's why we have to take uh, the whole water resource from Sungai Muda for time being. So this is some tributary, you know, but Sungai Pinang is about 3.6 kilometer uh, before they enter uh, the this what you call this uh, S3. But we cannot forget that you know, out of surface water that coming from rain, you know, uh, to become river, lake, or sea, there are few more water resources that we forget uh, to probably establish further in Penang. One is definitely groundwater. There are some place that got groundwater that we're not really uh, using yet. Uh, rainwater harvesting, like in USM, you know, we have big system of rainwater harvesting, is, which is one of the pi pilot project of the country. I will show you later. Waste and grey sewerage water, technically, uh, people didn't uh, try to use this because it's proved to be uh, some cost that need to be incurred there compared to very low tariff in Penang. And now people start talking about atmospheric water and the water. If you go to Israel, for example, you know, when the people walk in the building, they can quickly drink the water from uh, just an isolated system, uh, just like a filter water system, you know, a stay in the middle of nowhere. You know, this is the water from atmospheric. So one of my research now with Nahrin is try uh, to ca capture the dew water in early in the morning and also as spring water because uh, we have high humidity. So technically, for the way forward, we have to learn from uh, established uh, country. This is the example of Korea, uh, whereby the president of uh, previous president of Korea is technically ex mayor you know, of the Seoul city. He has transformed Cheong Gai Chong River, although this is man-made, making a motivation to the whole Seoul city, anti Seoul city uh, become the example of the world. So you can see the color of the water here. So now uh, we're coming to the example in Malaysia. This is a USM engineering campus. Uh, this is a project that I myself introduced, invent and design, and now become my research back, you know and later on will become DNA of USM, you know. The whole student that come into USM need to come to read that at least one day before they leave USM so as they know what is water security is about. This all the uh, green one. This is the first green campus uh, as far as the water resource is concerned in the country. So technically, uh, DID has come in with a uh, new manual called Urban Storm Water Management Manual. Then uh, this is the first campus in Malaysia 20 years ago uh, that compliance uh, to the Urban Storm Water Management Manual. So this is the example that we have. So technically, if you have this kind of green uh, design of infra, technically the water that flow into the system is technically clean in the class 2A or class 2B at least. You know, you can see the color of water flow during the rain event. Uh, coming into the, our pond, then later on going to the, our wetland, then later on you will see that the color of water uh, that uh, inside our lake that can be used for the student activity, including the domestic purpose of USM. So if we can have this color of water flow, you know, uh, through our system, technically uh, you can probably having uh, this kind of activity. This is the hostel in engineering campus. So this is the activity that our students have now. So we will share with the new student in this coming November. There are about 3,000 students will come uh, and spend one day uh, in USN. So this is a visitor, you know, throughout the country, including the minister. Uh, technically, they just want to see uh, the shadow probably. This is biology indicator. They can see the shadow in the clean water. But you go to the Penang River, if you see the shadow, I advise you, you better go home because this is not your shadow. You know, probably this is somebody else. Dangerous. So another project that I highlight as far as education is concerned is from JKR. This is in, in French's life uh, in Timor Laos. 
So this is the, the, the area given to us as education. So this is the example of using rainwater uh, rather than use the tap water, you know, uh, for this project. So we suppose uh, to use uh, the correct water uh, for the correct reason, you know, for time being, uh, we do have uh, the possibility to do that because in our building, we do have that capacity. But in engineering campus, we have planned to do that. And, and later on, we probably will take our lake water uh, into our student domestic hostel because the pressure of the water in the hostel here are super low. So before uh, I end my presentation, this is some summary that uh, I want you to read through. Uh, so technically, you know, when we talk about the sustainable urban drainage system, uh, bioecological drainage system, that uh, this is a trademark uh, that innovated by us 20 years ago. A uh, lot of other projects as, as, as probably uh, in place uh, right now in the country. There are a lot, you know, every state normally have this project. If not designed by us, it's designed by other engineers. So, uh, please help me, you know, to transform Malaysia in water saving country. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Professor Azazi. That's a very inspiring presentation. Now we know that there are other alternatives, um, whether the alternatives uh, are feasible or not, I guess it uh, depends a lot on many things. Uh, uh, but one of the most promising one is whether we can use our rivers. And as far as I know, JPS has um, launched a river cleaning campaign. We tried to get some representatives from JPS to join us today, but unfortunately they couldn't make it. But I, I, I believe that there are some efforts to clean up our rivers. And according to PBA, as far as I remember, um, they have said that if Sabran, uh, Sungai Prai can be cleaned and be used as a water source, uh, it will probably uh, help meet about 10% of water supply. It's, it's, not, it's not huge, it's not 90%, but it, it helps, every little helps. And in terms of uh, uh, using our storm water, so because at the moment, uh, we let our storm water go uh, straight to uh, the sea. Uh, okay. Some of them stays, you know, and flood our land. We don't really harvest it. We don't really store it. Apart from the project that you mentioned at the French Design School, right? That is yeah. one of the uh, uh, projects that is capturing and storing storm water that can then can be used. So there are a lot of possibilities and we are very impressed by what Redak is uh, doing and we hope that you get all the support that you need. And uh, I think when it comes to water use, one of the biggest uh, factors that we have to take into account is consumer behavior and, and raising awareness, promoting uh, water saving behaviors, promoting the installation of water saving devices and all these is not new. They, are, they have been actively promoted by PBA, by uh, NGOs like uh, um, Pinan Water, all these you know, organizations have tried this. But we should continue uh, to try to do our best. Thank you again, Professor Azazi. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We will come back to you later with a lot of questions, I'm sure. And just a, re a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, please feel free to, to leave uh, your questions on our chat uh, section or comment. And next presenter is uh, Dr. Abe. Dr. Abe is from CMAX uh, USM, and he'll be sharing with us some exciting and in interesting facts about our seas. And uh, I think we will find out later that we know generally, uh, most of the public, we know very little about our sea and our marine resources, even though we're surrounded by that. So uh, looking forward to it, Dr. Abe. Uh, please feel free to start whenever. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Shibe. Um, thank you again for inviting CMAX as well as me to talk a little bit on um, probably things that um, has been neglected. And I will show you a little bit while um, I want to talk about marine biodiversity itself. I think it's a very big topic to cover in 15 minutes time. So I will just pick um, two of the things that I think um, probably it meant a lot to us, as well as um, and things that people might have not um, thought it would be in Penang itself. So um, I simply just use the title Marine Biodiversity at Penang. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of the things that uh, probably we have. Uh, let me 
change. Right. Um, to put things in perspective. Uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Abia, sorry to yeah. interrupt. Can you make yeah. your screen, uh, the presentation full screen, please? I, I thought it was, it was not in the picture. Like, we can me, still see it. it oh, really? Yeah. Let me check. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. You saw what do? Is it is it good now? Uh, we can still. See. It doesn't matter. We can. Still, uh, okay, that's great. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Um, so um, to put things in perspective, um, let's uh, um, let's um, take a step back and look at um, what it is that we are living on. Um, this is called Earth um, for many, many, many generations. Um, in fact, it's, we have known this forever as Earth. But in fact, um, my my teacher always taught me this that. The Earth actually is 70% covered by water. And uh, the name Earth itself probably is a misleading name. Uh, probably we should call it a ball of water or, or marble because um, if you look from the space, it's blue. So 70% of it is covered by actually salt water. So um, just like what you have listened to Prof. Azazi. Uh, but actually, in actual fact, uh, the world actually is covered. Most of it is salt water that is not drinkable, but uh, it inhabits with a lot of animals and other resources that is a very important, that serves as a very important ecological service to, to sustain Earth itself. Okay, um, just dive in a little bit on when we talk about biodiversity. Um, biodiversity itself uh, means that we count the number of species as well as the, the, um, the different species that occurs um, in, in certain place, places. So specifically, I'm drawing your attention to look at, uh, not on the land, to look at the sea itself. Uh, this is a species density, or uh, what we call as in death indices, or um, how, much, how many species are there uh, of fishes in, in the world. Uh, if you can see, uh, towards the red color of the spectrum uh, means that there is more species occurring in that specific area. So if you look at dive deep down into our area, you can see that actually we are sitting uh, Malaysia is sitting at a very important um, marine biodiversity hotspot where we almost have the maximum marine biodiversity in the whole world. Uh, we may not be rich uh, in terms of economical um, strength or power, but in terms of marine biodiversity, we are surely at the top, at least top 10 or top 20 in the world. Uh, something that we have not been appreciating enough. Um, dive in a little bit, uh, a little bit more nearer to us. Uh, this is a, a, a map uh, plotted um, against, uh, just now you see just the fishes, but in terms of that, to sustain a lot of diversity of fishes means we have to have a lot of different ecosystem uh, in the marine environment to sustain different species. So this is a, a collective uh, data that looks at the different um, species of corals as well as the fishes. Then again, you will see that we are actually really, really sitting on um, the world's bank of uh, uh, coral species. Um, and you may see that uh, they may concentrate along the Philippines and Indonesia, but actually it spans along the South China Sea as well as where Penang is sitting at, at the edge of where it is. So therefore, um, protecting them actually is actually, actually very extremely important. Right, so um, we're talking about Penang. So uh, let us deep dive into uh, what Penang is. Uh, this is what you see for Ranjanga Strapuna New Pulau Pinang. This is the physical plan planning um, for, for the Penang State up to 2020. So if you let, look at the various colors uh, in the map, uh, you will realize that we have done a lot, a lot, a lot of planning on the land. So our focus itself is actually on the land. But if you look like, around our state itself, um, it's surrounded by seawater and it's totally blank uh, unless you are looking at um, areas which uh, are set to be reclaimed. So anything that is not land, uh, we don't really have any plan for it in, in actual fact. Um, did dive a little bit down. Yeah, you can see um, that's what I meant by it is completely uh, blank. Uh, we don't really consider this area as is, it is important for planning. Um, unless then again, if you look at uh, places that we're going to reclaim. Um, so that's why I'm going to draw your attention to certain places that um, perhaps um, it has been forgotten and perhaps it needs to be looked at um, um, a little bit more uh, in detail, um, especially at this area, which I will show you later. Okay, um, Penang has a, a few more subsidiary islands actually in our surrounding uh, 
main island. But uh, then again, it was forgotten. Uh, but the most important part is that uh, this, some of this island actually inhabits a very important ecosystem, which is actually, I don't like to call them a coral reef because they don't, coral reef actually refers to corals that build into a very big fragments and a big uh, complex of uh, reef system uh, that have different structures. But um, actually we do actually have uh, local corals that um, they live in patches that um, is within the south of our island. Um, if you can draw your attention to Pulau Rimau and Pulau Kendi, uh, those are the red areas which I have marked. Actually, uh, those areas, if you dive, probably I will not suggest that because it's a very dangerous area to dive as well as the turbid. Um, they actually have um, some species of coral that are able to uh, withstand as well as live uh, in that kind of water that we may not think it is possible because most of our image that coral lives in a um, clear water system, as like in Pulau Redang or in Sabah, where you can see really clear water. Um, that makes us, uh, the coral reef actually is very, very extremely uh, important, which I will explain later why it is important. Um, these are some of the pictures, actually, if you dive at a very extremely good weather or a good uh, water, actually, you still can take some picture. But most of the time, uh, it is just like diving in Tehtare. So, um, it, it is a very uh, difficult place to die. But um, surprisingly, you still can see uh, actually lives is booming. Um, those are the, uh, those corals that you see, actually you may not see as much um, uh, in areas which is uh, clear water because uh, these are corals that are categorized as uh, turbid water corals, which later on uh, in the next slide, I will tell you why it is important. So looking at the Straits of Malacca and where Penang is situated at Straits of Malacca, we are actually situated at the busiest place in the world. Um, these are the, uh, if you can see the, the route that those are the traveling routes of um, ships or container ships that pass through um, Straits of Malacca. So it's a very busy strait. So um, it is actually high with a lot of pollutants. Uh, it is not just from shipping. Uh, it is high turbidity and sedimentation because uh, there's a lot of big rivers flowing from um, the Sumatra as well as the peninsula Malaysia flowing into the streets of Malacca carrying a lot of, uh, I don't want to call them pollutants, but uh, sediments um, and uh, subsidiary nutrients that flows into streets of Malacca. So in streets of Malacca, actually is a very stressed area uh, for marine um, animals. And it is also a lower salinity area because this is a straight seven big rivers from peninsula, seven big rivers from the Sumatra is flowing fresh water into it. So it's slightly a little bit um, lower salinity as well as lower pH. Now, why is this is very important. And therefore, um, in terms of climate change and not, we were expecting our waters, our seawater around, um, not just Malaysia, around the world is going to be more polluted. Um, we have a lower salinity. We also have the onset of ocean acidification uh, from climate change. So, but still yet, we can still find animals that is um, especially coral reefs uh, that actually lives in Straits of Malacca. So this will be um, a very important source for juveniles to start recolonizing areas where, this, um, where clear water corals might die easily because of stress, because they are not used to stress, because of the corals that has adapted well into stress area. So these are the corals that are actually going to be important uh, to be transported to other places where we're going to see more effect. Uh, climate change as well, uh, like as ocean acidification or whatnot. So our corals are actually very important because one thing we have to remember that they are adapted to very high stress and yet they survive. Um, uh, I'm just going to pick two things as I said. Uh, this is going to be the second thing. Uh, we're going to draw our attention to uh, that area uh, that has been forgotten as well, a very narrow strait between the, um, the mainland and the, uh, the Penang Island. Uh, if you drive uh, through the Penang Bridge to Penang Island, it is on your uh, right hand side. Um, so this is actually an area uh, I think with high importance, high economic importance as well. Actually, um, this area, these two areas are called uh, in the north we call this uh, it's called Middle Bank. Uh, during low tide, actually you can see actually they are uh, um, yeah, it is not submerged. And uh, why is it important? Uh, show you this is what it looks like actually when uh, the water uh, recedes, uh, recedes. So 
Um, these are area actually is very, very important for seagrass. Actually, we have a very big seagrass patch in Penang itself. Um, to the record, actually, we have only three to four uh, seagrass patch, which the other places not as extensive as in Penang. So we almost have the largest uh, seagrass patch in the Straits of Malacca itself. So this is a very unique environment uh, to be in Penang. And so um, USMC Max has been doing uh, long-term monitoring for almost 15 years, uh, trying to look at uh, the, the changes throughout 15 years of, uh, of, of, of development and how the seagrass uh, dies and come back and changes in its morphology. Um, those are the pictures that I will show you more pictures uh, that many people don't see. Uh, this is uh, we have at least four to five different species of seagrass uh, occurring at these uh, areas. So you can see these are Anhylus acroides. It's very important to have structure. Um, and these are actually sea animals that live uh, together with, with the seagrass in that area. Uh, more pictures. Uh, people don't believe it because uh, if you say seagrass in Penang, people won't believe it. So uh, pictures probably will show you um, it is true. And um, probably later on, I will tell you why is it actually important to have. And looking at the biodiversity itself, Seagrass actually supports a lot, a lot, a lot of different animals uh, within the area. Uh, these are just some of the things that probably people don't see that much, so I'm highlighting them. Uh, we're not going to talk about so much about fishes or, or bivalves. Uh, these are the things that actually more special something like chitin that people has not has forgotten about them. But within five minutes or something, you can see the various different types of biodiversity of chitons that you already can find. Imagine how much more any other animals that can be living in that area. And actually seagrass is also a nesting area for a lot of fishes as well as a bivalve, which is important economically for the fishing, for the fishing industry in Penang itself. Um, as I say again, uh, if you tie it up with climate change, seagrass actually is actually extremely important. Um, just like uh, what is written here, like seagrass is 35 times more efficient as, as a storing carbon than rainforest itself. So a lot of times when we do planning, we, we only plan what we can see. It's like we can see the forest. So we love the forest, we protect the forest. But in terms of things that we do not see, uh, we are not doing enough planning for them. Um, these are just an example of many, many other more tiny animals, which is very important to support um, the food web as well as the productivity of, uh, of Penang waters. So I'm just going to end very quickly uh, taking quotes from the famous uh, Sir David Attenborough that um, no one will protect uh, what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. So um, if you have not seen it uh, or if you have not gone to it, probably you will not appreciate that much. But I have a better, I, I think it's a better quote for myself. So I say you can't protect things that you don't know. So first thing we have to really go look out for things that we do not know and try to educate ourselves, try to expose ourselves to things um, like marine biodiversity that probably has been left untaken care of. Um, by that, um, I will be happy to take any question if there's any. Um, I'll, I'll pass back to you, Dr. Ng. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abe. Uh, like I promised you, uh, the audience, it's a very interesting presentation, and I bet most of you have learned something new. Apart from maybe Dr. Eileen, who is also in the audience, she's, <laughs> she's been doing all this for a long time. So. It's, it's high time, I think, to understand and to appreciate our marine biodiversity. Uh, at the moment, I think for Penang Nights, we see the sea as a way to travel. We have our ferries, we have the cargo ships coming in, we have the cruise ships, and also where we catch our fish, right? It's an important source of uh, food. And we have heard in the second webinar on food security, we have seen that climate change by increasing the, 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 the pH level of the sea and also the temperature of the sea, we are going to drive away a lot of our staple fish, like the mackerel. Uh, so, so that's obviously causing concern, but also we uh, also need to protect our biodiversity uh, for what they are, not what they contribute as, as, as our food or, or, or something. So if you are interested, if you are curious, please do contact Dr. Abe, we, uh, he's, in front, uh, he's in front of the picture of CMAX. You know, CMAX is in the National Park uh, in Telobahang. Uh, please get in touch with them if you want to learn more about, about uh, our marine resources, our marine biodiversity. And also, I think it's 
it's about time we celebrate our biodiversity. We have a Georgetown festival, you know, we celebrate our Penang Hill, we celebrate our Georgetown. We should celebrate our biodiversity. So anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Abe, for your very informative, uh, informative and interesting pictures. And I think a lot of people in our audience have fallen in love with our seagrass. Now we'll move on to Dr. Ahmad. Dr. Ahmad um, similarly will give us some sort of uh, overview of the unique species and about the biodiversity that we have in Penang. Penang is pretty small island and mainland, but we do have unique species, as you will find out from his uh, presentation. Uh, so Dr. Ahmad will focus more on terrestrial uh, biodiversity, you know, uh, animals or, or uh, organisms in the forest, in our bushes. But yeah, Dr. Ahmad, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. But, uh, uh, let me share my screen now. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, just now, yeah, the, uh, the Tabe mentioned that, yeah, people, uh, the Tabe talk about the, the marine biodiversity. So, uh, my topic was beyond Chakwetiao and Laksa, the unique wildlife diversity of Penang. So, from the rivers to the sea, now back to the forest, back to the land. So, why, why, why have I choose this title? Because normally when uh, people, even people who are staying in Penang, when you, when you ask them, what's so special about Penang? They certainly say it's the food, it's the Chakwetiao, uh, it's the Laksa, it's the Pasambo. And even people who, who come and visit Penang, the tourists that come, local or international tourists that come to Penang, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll come and look for the food. How many of them do actually come to look at And some of the biodiversity that we have uh, are endemic to Penang, meaning they can only be found in Penang and nowhere else uh, in the world. Let me start with this uh, tarantula, uh, the black femur tarantula. Uh, it's, a, it's just about the size of your, your, your palm here. Uh, it's not that big, uh, but it is a beauty. And this tarantula can only be found in Penang. And then I'll, I'll show you another, uh, this photo, the Penang rock gecko. Uh, it is more beautiful than the house gecko that you have in, in your house, uh, the one that climb uh, in your walls and ceilings. Uh, this uh, rock gecko is a habitat specialist. Uh, they can only be found uh, living near or under large boulders. Uh, they're also endemic, uh, uh, yeah, so that's why we call it the Penang rock gecko. Uh, the size is just about the size of a a house gecko and then we have another uh, Penang limited edition uh, the Penang banded gecko uh, this one can grow up to about 20 centimeters uh, from from the head to the to the tail uh, yeah they are they are more active at night so in the day you can't really see them they'll be, they'll be hiding uh, this is my favorite, this uh, bright orange uh, Penang Hill Vampire Crab. This species, as just the other, the previous species, can only be found uh, in Penang. It is very small, it is only about two, the adults, the largest of the adults will only be around 2.5 centimeters uh, wide. Uh, this is a male. Uh, the females uh, don't have uh, the colors are not as bright as the, uh, the as the, the females don't have the bright color as this. Uh, endemic to Penang, only discovered in 2016. Uh, it lives up on the hill, uh, Penang Hill, 700 meters 700 meters above sea level only, and that's the only place that you can find them in the world. And uh, the speciality about these crabs is that they don't live in in the rivers, they don't live in streams. They live up on a hill, in between leaves that cl collects rainwater, uh, or sometimes they live in holes uh, on branches on trees that 
there's uh, some water, uh, stagnant water. That's where they stay. So yeah, a true Penang Lang. Uh, besides that, we also have uh, some other interesting, unique species such as this uh, Kolugo. Uh, people don't really know the presence of this species because they are more active at night. And then in the day, this Kolugo will just be hanging down on the branch like this. And as you, as you can see, the color of the, the, the hair, the fur of this Kolugo and compared with the color of the branch, so they, they, they camouflage well. So that's why when they are hanging or when they're, they're hanging on a branch or they're hugging uh, a tree, in the day, normally you won't be able to see them and they're only up active at night. They'll be, they can glide from tree to tree uh, up to 100 meters. So uh, yeah, this uh, recently during, I think maybe it was in April, there was a video that went viral or people seeing that oh this is the animal that have been causing COVID nineteen. Uh, people just don't know the presence of of a klugo. Uh, this animal can be found throughout Southeast Asia. Okay, next. Okay, I have a short video to share with you all. Uh, let's see if you can. People can guess what species is this. This is also a very special species. Uh, I'll just play that again. Uh, they only come out active at night. In the day, you won't be able to see them. If you go to uh, Penang Botanical Garden or if you go to Penang Hill, Pantai Kracut, uh, you'll be able you'll be able to see this species. It's actually the red giant flying squirrel. It's uh, the biggest squirrel species in Asia. Uh, it's about the size, without its tail, it's about the size of a a cat, a domestic cat, and they can also glide from tree to tree. Okay, this is uh, the dusky langur or the dusky leaf monkey. Uh, recently, last month, uh, the, leaf, the leaf monkey was downgraded. They were reclassified as endangered uh, under the IUCN release, meaning that they're, they're more threatened than before in the in areas where they can be found. Uh, for this species, people love to catch their babies because of the, you can see the, the, the bright yellow, orangey color of their babies just make people, people feel attracted to have to keep them as pets. Uh, without, and when they buy these little monkeys as pets, and they didn't know that actually after five to six months, the yellow orange monkey will just turn into dark gray just like their mother. So it won't be as as attractive as before, and yeah, people then then don't find them nice anymore or, or cute anymore. Huh. Okay. Now I'm just gonna show you that a video that we got up on Penang Hill at the habitat. Uh, a, a real catwalk. Have a look. Hey, sorry. Okay, uh, I'll just play it again. Okay, that's, that, that's not a domestic cat, okay? It's a leopard cat. Uh, as, uh, as the Kulugo, the flying squirrel, this cat is also active at night, so that's why people don't see them. Uh, they, this species can adapt well with uh, some disturbance they can also they can also be found living in plantations uh, disturbed forest uh, they, they will be a beautiful cat uh, normally you can find them being road kills if you drive along highways uh, in Perak, Kelantan, Kedah you, you will be find them road kills dead by the road this is also another species that a lot of people in Penang don't know their existence. You can see it's just rubbing its neck, uh, leaving its scent on, on the rattan there. Good, there's, there's a slow loris, uh, the only venomous primate in the world. Yeah, they, they, they have venom. 
um, besides habitat loss, this species is also threatened due to illegal pet trade. Yeah, people buy them because they they look they're cute. So people just wanna wanna keep them as pets. But that's that is illegal. Okay, these species are protect. This species this species is protected by the Wildlife Protection Act. So since uh, we've been talking about water, uh, so so just let's discuss a bit about water and wildlife. Some species uh, of animals are highly dependent on water, uh, just like this Stolizia stoliscana, the Penang stream crab. Uh, this crab is also endemic to Penang. Yeah, yeah, they can be found nowhere else except in Penang, in streams of Penang. So, uh, what would happen to 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 the, this crab if we pollute our streams? Okay, they can only be found in clean, uh, clean stream water. Uh, clean. Uh, they need to be clean. Uh, the streams need to be clean. Uh, running water. So they'll be living there. So if if we pollute our streams, what would happen to this crab? They have nowhere else to go. We won't have this. We will just lose this species. And as as mentioned by Prof earlier, Penang rivers are polluted. And when this happens, it doesn't only affect the animals living in in the in the river, living in the stream, but also other animals uh, which are dependent upon the river, uh, like the the kingfishers, the other birds, the other animals. They are also affected when we have polluted rivers. And then uh, the issue of uh, pollution doesn't only affect them directly but also indirectly. We have microplastics. Uh, Penang, we have this campaign of uh, no single-use plastics. So this is one of the reasons. Uh, everything that we do on land will actually happen, uh, will actually affect uh, our wildlife in in the in in the river or in the streams in the river and even down to the sea uh, and then as i showed you earlier the photo photo of uh, of the chakwitiao with nice big prawns on it if we pollute our water systems then the pollution will go to the sea and then when it goes to the sea it certainly will affect uh, the marine diversity that we have as as Dr. Abe have mentioned, and then, yeah, who knows? In, uh, in the near future, we might not be able to have prawns anymore because we have, we have, uh, the 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 marine system has collapsed because 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 of, of the pollution that we cause on land. And then, when that happens, it'll just the the food web, uh, the ecosystem will just collapse. So. What would happen to the wildlife in Penang when climate change strikes? So earlier I was just talking about the pollution. Uh, for this uh, vampire hill crab, they can only be found at a certain elevation, 700 meters above sea level only. So just imagine uh, in the next 10 years, if the temperature rises, what will happen to them? They'll need to find a cooler area. Seven hundred meters. They they are there because it's more cooler. But then, when the, the the whole environment gets get hot, where can this species go? Penang's highest elevation is only eight hundred thirty five meters. So where else can this particular species find a cool place? Well, and then if they can't find any place, if they can't adapt, what will happen to them? They just they'll just extinct from from Penang. And then and then. We might lose a species that we have just recently discovered, and we have not even be able to study them. We don't even know the their functions, the the life cycle. Uh, we don't know much uh, about this species. Uh, currently, we have one uh, student from UMT who's uh, Siti Kadia, who's worked with the Habitat Foundation, who's looking at this species and what are what are the habitat needs, what are the uh, habitat parameters that influence the presence of uh, the Penang Hill vampire crab. And then I just want to touch a bit uh, on the impact towards pollinators. 
uh, pollinators. Yep, we have bees, stingless bees, butterflies, moth. These are all, uh, birds. They are all pollinators. When the world gets warmer, what will happen to the species that can't adapt? Uh, recently, there was a report that says that lot lot of species lot of species of insects uh, have the population have been reduced drastically due to climate change uh, because it's getting warmer uh, the sudden change of weather patterns uh, it just affect the population of these pollinators and when these pollinators play a great role great role in for food production around the world uh, even in penang we are famous for durian and all without pollinators would we be able to enjoy our durian, rambutan, all the fruits, vegetables and all? We won't. So, it will affect our food source. It will affect our durian. It will also affect our fruits and all. And also, it will just affect the, the wildlife food chain. Because we, when, the smaller animal, when the smaller insects die, then the bigger animals won't have food. The birds, what would they eat? uh the the birds that in, the, the, the that are dependent on on insects right? the carnivorous birds what would they eat if this these insects are being wiped out so it'll just create an ecosystem ecosystem collapse and it'll just affect not just the animals but also affecting us so yeah how how can we help the wildlife around us uh is there a role that we can play uh, a lot of people think that oh I I live in an apartment oh I live in Georgetown I can't help I live in Penang oh I I can't help the animals but then actually there are things that you can do. Number one, you can have plants in your garden that can help biodiversity and nature. Yeah, you can have a garden even if you are living in a small apartment with a balcony. You can have a garden in your balcony. Uh, you can plant. You can have plants that attracts pollinators uh, have with flowers uh, that attract butterflies, bees, stingless bees. And then at the same time, you can also plant things that you can eat. You can plant your own vegetables that yeah, you can be good for the pollinators and also you can harvest them and yeah, save your, your, save your own money. So you can create your own small habitat for wildlife. Uh, you can have small, if you have a big house with, with a lawn, then you can have some small ponds, running water. So just create uh, to help, the, help uh, create a habitat to help these animals around you. Uh, one way uh, to, to help our environment, to help animals is to stop the use of pesticides and herbicides that kills them. Uh, if you plant your own garden, you plant your own food, then yeah, you can you will you won't be depending upon the the vegetables they have in the, in the supermarkets you you you're basically reducing the use of uh, pesticides and herbicides that, and these are all affecting our uh, water systems and affecting our wildlife our, our pollu uh, pollinators and all besides that uh, there are also other ways for you to help the, the animals around you uh, as, you, as you can see in these two reports, uh, dogs and cats are also a threat to wildlife. So animals, pets should be kept inside. Huh? Because these cats and dogs, they just like to catch lizards, small birds and all. And then sometimes they just catch something and just bring to you just to show, to show, just to show you how they, what they've done to, to get to get your attention. Yep, so you need to keep your, your pets inside. Don't let them stray around, especially if you are living uh, near a natural area. If you live if your house or your apartment is uh, in Tanjung Bunga, uh, Aita, near to the hill, near to the forest, so keep your, cat, keep your pets inside. Uh, this, Okay, these are not from Penang. This is uh, the 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 macaques, uh, baru, uh, and people love to feed the monkeys there, uh, and in, it happens in Penang Botanical Garden as well. 
But is that the right thing to do? No, it's actually it's not. Uh, we should not be if we want if we love monkeys, we should not be feeding them. Because that's just change the whole behavior. Uh, there's a risk of uh, cross disease uh, transfer between human and primates. So you should not be feeding monkeys uh, in botanical garden or anywhere else that you go. Okay, uh, this is a short video of in Tanjung Bunga. Uh, okay, so there, you can see there was a leaf monkey crossing the road. So whenever you're driving if near to natural sites, please be careful. Beri uh, laluan kepada haiwan liar, as said in the video. And then if you see anything uh, that threatens wildlife, if you see anything, people, people are trading or selling animals, people are collecting animals for sale, uh, you can call the wildlife crime hotline and report to them. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmad. I forgot to, to say again just now that Dr. Ahmad is from the Habitat Foundation and Habitat Foundation is, uh, I guess, is a charity, is a charity status, is formed by, uh, set up by the Habitat, the um, attraction, the attraction that is very, very nice. And Habitat Foundation, there's a lot of research, uh, education programs and, and, and you 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 give tours as well, right? I I, just, I saw a poster somewhere that you give uh, like virtual like safari tours, and you do work online virtual tours. So thank yeah. you so much. Uh, and ha the habitat was also involved in the BioBlitz a few years ago yes. together with USM an international collaboration where we found out uh, that a new a species that we we have, in, especially in the Penang Hill area. Uh, so we know more now about our terrestrial species thanks to efforts like that and thanks to uh, various organizations institutions including private sector like the habitat but we also have a lot of wild uh, uh, rich biodiversity on the mainland I, i'm sure we have uh, forest reserves there we have hills maybe we it's, it's time to do another bio bits but focusing on uh, what we have in in the brown pride but that is that was the bio bits uh, sort of uh, started off i think um like it kick started some curiosity and also obviously giving us uh, more knowledge about what we have in penang but starting off that curiosity about what we have here and how do we protect them. That was a good start. And I, I believe that the Penang Hill Corporation working with the uh, uh, like outfits like the Habitat is trying to apply for bio biosphere reserve status for a huge track of our um, uh, forests, in, especially in the Penang Hill area. Uh, and I, I'm sure that everyone is working very hard towards achieving that. But thank you again, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, now we have come to the Q&A session. I have been collecting some questions that have been asked uh, by our audience. I will probably start with uh, Dr. Abe. You have a, f a few questions, but I think you have answered one already that in terms of how many species of uh, seagrass uh, there are at the middle banks and you reply in the message. And there are, I guess, two other questions that are related to the reclamation projects in the south of uh, Penang and uh, I'm, I'm sorry that you've got um, the short stick here you have to answer uh, these questions but obviously to your uh, pers uh, uh, professional and, and personal views what are the things so so first question is what are the th what do you think how how the three uh, islands reclamation project will impact on uh, our marine life and uh, uh, marine biodiversity. And the second question is how does that uh, reclamation project will impact on seagrass? Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I knew this is going to come and this is going to be a very tough question to, to answer, but I'll, I'll try to as much um, to break it down a little bit easier. Um, any changes to marine environment will surely have certain impacts uh, by putting uh, creating islands or putting sand on certain areas of course you're gonna you're gonna take away certain um, 
habitat services. Um, how is it related to our seagrass? Um, in natural fact, the seagrass area that you see in, in Penang actually arises when we started to build our first bridge many, many, many years ago. Um, because that probably Prof. Azazi also can help me on this. Um, anything that you build on, 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 on the sea or on, on, on an area of water, um, you will change the hydrology itself. So changes of the hydrology as well as sedimentation has created certain, um, uh, it started with a sandbank and then things start to grow on it. So not all entirely bad. You see in, in this effect, you created certain areas that more, more, more biodiversity can thrive. But it, I cannot specifically answer how the three islands itself in the south uh, could be affecting um, the, the, the seagrass area that we have. But I'm quite sure there are going to be some impact. Positive or negative, we have to study about that. Um, as far as we have thus know so far is that uh, the Southern Island, when they did the environmental impact assessment, it did not cover, uh, the area of study did not cover up to the seagrass area. So definitely, um, we cannot give you an exact answer whether it will be positive or negative. But surely, there are going to be impact. Is it positive or negative? It's, it's, it's up to debate. That's number one. Number two, um, as I said, changes hydrology will change the movement of water, will change the movement of sediments, and the dumping and, and, and uh, the dump and the movement of sediment is actually extremely important for seagrass area because they depend on the ground and a suitable ground for them to, to grow. So definitely there are going to be changes. Um, what will be changes? This is something that we are ongoing going to study. Of course, we're going to give the best advice um, to the public as well as to the government on how do we deal with the reclamation. I think that possibly have answered um, the question, Dr. L, I think. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bay. And it, if any of you want to uh, ask further questions, you know, delve deeper into some of the questions, please feel free to get in touch with the speakers uh, directly or uh, come through us as well. And next I will go to, uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Abe, before you go, I think one question also related is uh, how, how do we, how are we handling pollution? But I don't know how. Uh, this is the attitude and education. Uh, when we enter Singapore, for example, I take a simple example. If you are the smoker, normally you will bring two boxes. One with cigarette and one is empty. Why you do that? Because you know that when you throw your, your, your cigarette there or any rubbish, uh, you definitely will get a, a, a fine letter that need to pay uh, on the door, you know. But when you enter back Malaysia through Johor, uh, you will continue doing the same thing. So enforcement looks like that is a beginning uh, before we start to educate people. Enforcement is the must now. So there is no other choice. If Malaysia, as far as Malaysia is concerned, uh, no enforcement, uh, then I think we will continue having the same problem. So this is hard. High time, I think, uh, for the government to start. You know, even now during the COVID, you know, if you don't find people, people don't really wear masks here. Nobody cares, you know. So that, that, that is a problem, you know. Uh, so with a 30 million uh, population, I think it is not difficult uh, to do some enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Professor Azazi. Please do not don't go yet because uh, it's your turn to answer some questions. We have collected four questions for you. Uh, I will ask like two each time. So the first two are: Is there a high level government forum or task force looking at the long term water security, and how can we move to a more integrated science based approach? So that's the first question: Is there a task force looking into long term water security and science based approach? 
Second question is, 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 it seems like from your presentation, there are a lot of untapped options for using water more responsibly. And, and why is the government thinking about building desalination plant instead of trying these uh, less cost-effective approaches first? So these are the two questions for you. Thank for you. The first part. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shinwei. So technically, uh, there are few level of uh, government uh, committee. You know, uh, there are also NGO. You know, are uh, looking in this. I, 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 I in both NGO. One is MSO, Malaysian Stormwater Organization, led by the ID. Another one is MENSI, yeah, Malaysia National Committee on Irrigation and Drainage. This is under Ministry of Agriculture. So technically, when we talk about water, uh, there are three clusters that we need to look. When we talk about water, we need to look into the food production because there are food policy. As far as we are concerned, uh, in food uh, policy in the country, food security, uh, we need to eat rice. I don't know why we eat rice. Rice is using so much water. 70% of our water resource has to go to Ministry of Agriculture because of the food uh, security uh, reason. But technically, uh, I don't know why is it good to eat rice, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, the other people in other part of the country, you know, who win football most of the time didn't eat any rice in their life. But when we are about six months old last time, our mother forced us, you don't eat this kind of rice, they find another rice. If they eat the, 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 the hard rice, they, they, they try to put more water. Until you like to eat rice, then today you got no choice. You already eat rice three times a day. So technically, you be, use more water, you know, uh, until you change your food habit. You know, there are a lot of nasi kanda restaurant that rice is uh, the base of of the food. You know, every every day. You know, after this lunch, I think everybody ninety percent of our audience here will eat rice after this. So technically, when you eat rice, you use water. That is the problem. So uh, this high-level government for time being having problem because there are few ministries involved uh, as far as my presentation is concerned. First, definitely uh, for, for time being, CASA, before they call NRE. Okay? So they just change the name, but the function is still the same. MOA, under agriculture, looking for food security. Even if you go to Sabah and Sarawak, Ministry of Transport looking into the licensing of when you need a license for the boat, for the vehicle uh, in, into the water. Water is state matter. All the chief minister and, and, and Menteri Besar is the head of the state and have right uh, to decide on water resources. You know? So technically, uh, there are something on governance uh, that, that, that I mentioned because the presentation is only 15 minutes. You know? So... We, we do have time to elaborate more. So technically, in my presentation, there are slides showing the governance is the main issue. So technically, uh, we have big problem right now. That's why, although I about two years to retire, uh, the UNESCO asked me to write uh, a piece of proposal. And now, when I write, straight away, uh, they have approved for the uh, launching for UNESCO chair to take care of the SDG C. What is SDG C? SDG C is to make sure that the in the Asia and Pacific people uh, will have a right to the clean water uh, and safe sanitary. So technically, uh, this is the, my 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 job now uh, to make sure that the whole ministry understand uh, we only dealing with one issue, and this issue technically can be solved if governance issue is settled. Because when one minister calls for the meeting, the other minister definitely won't come. So the prime minister want to call this is too much already. It's just about water. So I believe UNESCO will become a very active uh, system, you know, uh, to put people together, you know, to, to become a, a caretaker, you know. Uh, we will start in Malaysia. So later on, we will model it in Asia and Pacific. This is the first question. Second, on why government uh, talking about using high-tech technology. I mentioned to you how many water resources we have now. We have 4.5 times more than the world average. Okay? 
Uh, then that's me. We have enough water. The problem that in Malaysia, why flooding is happen because we don't have enough storage. So the, even the rain coming, the whole water will go to the sea directly. That's why I made a joke, you know, uh, during one of my presentation last time. If you want to have a clean river, you need to start looking at your drain because the whole drain will clean the river. But the idea coming with a clean river system. But when you clean the river, you try to clean the sea because the whole clean water will go to the sea straight away. So I think we, we, we need to, 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 to start looking into this thing thoroughly. Uh, that's why I, 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 because the reason why I'm moving to UNESCO is because uh, UNESCO is probably the only body that normally doing uh, the lot of seminar, uh, discussion and whatnot uh, throughout the Asia Pacific. So uh, there are a lot of water resource. So it's just uh, the government need to decide what they want to. I have made a big proposal before the, you know, the one that happened in, in KL uh, last week, you know, on the heavy flood and whatnot. Technically, my proposal has addressed this 20 years ago. But government chose to go for water transfer project. This is just address the water supply issue. But we have three main issues. It's not just flood. We have water scarcity. in Selangor one week before flooding. But whether the water scarcity settled after the flood, the answer is no. Because they never have enough storage and enough water treatment system. Then last but not least, river is polluted. And last previously, we asked the question about why we, we put the, the, the plastic. It's not just plastic. You, you go to the seaside, you know, or you, you try to take uh, one fish and, 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 and do some operation. Dr. Eileen uh, might be doing that. You know, you will see a lot of other things rather than the food inside, the fish stomach, you know. So this is a big problem right now. So technically, why government uh, looking for the other technique, I'm not sure. Just like a water transfer project, it's not a cheap project, you know. Uh, because the best method to settle the water issue is to settle the problem in their own catchment. This is the best engineering solution but we go to the last solution, which is taking the water from the other catchment. I don't know why the government need to answer that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Azazi. So I'll come to the next two questions for, still for you, uh, but I just want to touch on upon the governance of the water issue. Oh I think, yeah, okay. I think here is, we have this problem, right? Why is oh, well, we're not looking into underground water, rivers, yeah. and all this storm? I think part of the issue is because these different angles of uh, uh, these different types of water are governed by different agencies. For example, yeah. GPS is in charge of you know, managing yes. storm water. PBS is in charge of getting you know clean treating water yeah. suppliers with drinking water. Yeah. IWK is in charge of our sewage. Baxa yeah. is in charge of the you know, water allocation. So it's yeah. not like in Singapore where from the the moment the raindrop comes down to land to when it's flushed off uh, into the sea or, or river as storm water or sewage. It's governed by one body. So yes, a more integrated, uh, uh, holistic approach can yeah. be taken when it's under one body like that. Like you yeah. explained just now, you know, different agencies govern different, uh, different aspects of things. When one agency wants to have a meeting, the other agency might not turn up, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think governance is one of the main obstacles of us of exploring all these different sort of uh, uh, um, possibilities. But uh, the next two questions for you uh, related to, again, comparing us with Singapore. So uh, do you think we are able to replicate the marine reservoir and urbanized catchment in Singapore to increase stormwater storage in Penang locally? Second question is, uh, by 2060, new water is expected to meet up to 55% of Singapore's future water demand. Can we replicate uh, the success of new water in Penang? Thank you, uh, Shinwei. So technically, similar answer to those question. Compared to Singapore, both are the Singapore element. Uh, of course, we can do, but we no need to do because we have enough water. As I mentioned, Singapore don't have water. They have no choice. You know, if Malaysia stop the water to flow to Singapore, I think they are in trouble. You know, so technically, uh, we have enough water. 
the problem that we have if governance is not settled. We need to work together. That's why I have bringing the UNESCO chair into this country. This is the first in Malaysia. You know, as far as we are concerned, we have so much problem of the water. Until today, this is the only country don't have UNESCO chair for water management. Okay, you know, although we have about five or seven ministry involved in water resources. So how this thing happen? So this is wrong. So that, that's why I have no choice. I, I'm telling you that, you know, just now, that I'm about two years uh, to retire, but I have no choice. I cannot live in the country like this, you know. So I, I, I need to, 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 to you know, to, to, to start thinking how to settle this in efficient way. Because I'm struggling in, in, in stage of conference for 20 years already. But until today, at least, uh, there are people like, you know, like you and the other part of the uh, association that, that have taken care, you know. But technically, we just started. For the country like Korea and whatnot, they wait for 20 years until they change everything. That means we need another 20 years to settle all this issue when the governance issue settle. Then we will start using all this uh, technical knowledge and whatnot. You know, we have 20 IPTA and, and there are 50 IPTAs in the country. They are all experts inside that. But they cannot settle the governance issue until the political people are willing to listen to us. You know? I don't believe any politician are inside our forum now. They are supposed to know this, you know. But, you know, I'm talking to people who know the whole issue. That is the problem. But where are we going to bring the issue? It's taken me 20 years, you know, already. But now i just doing whatever project that, you know, uh, I have. Or I can do it, you know. So technically now, we know that we can settle the water from rain harvesting. In Penang, for example, flooding... Is, is, is something that, you know, you cannot uh, uh, protect, you know, when 100 millimeter rain for two hours happen in Georgetown, definitely you are flooding, you know that. So why not the government starting by putting a, 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 a compulsory issue that the whole house need to cater one or two meter cube of rain, you know, uh, through the rainwater harvesting. I believe they will reduce the flooding or probably this is a zero flooding state one. Second, why not we try to look into or mapping the groundwater that's still available down there? We just need to control. And it's a good income to the government because every meter cube of, of water uh, the people take from the, gr the ground, normally the government will charge five cents. This is a good income. Thirdly, there are a lot of technology, including wetland and whatnot, that I also part of the research in Nahrim now. I have two projects. One to settle. Uh, a pollution issue uh, from the sewage system, you know, in Pulau, Tioman, and also in Malacca, because their 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 their, their uh, STP is just uh, beside the water supply there. They have the issue, and now as I mentioned to you, the new technology. Why not we have the water that forty two percent every day moving into the sky because this is high humidity country. There's me forty two percent of water in our sky. Why don't we harvest that? There are technology to do that. And I have done uh, my replicate model uh, because this project has been complete, you know, uh, to Nahri. So I think uh, why we need to go to expensive solution while the water is just uh, behind us or under us, you know, in, as far as the groundwater is concerned. Of course, we can do because technology is something that we can do. You can make a house in the moon, you know, there are technology. You also can make the, 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 the building in the sea because this is also technology. But why we need to replicate or, or, or probably copy people that having different problems? Singapore has not enough water. That's why they have to do that. There is no choice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Azazi. And I think we all understand the frustration of not being able to penetrate penetrate through the system and getting uh, actions done. And instead of doing big projects, perhaps it will cost a lot of money. There are a lot of smaller, uh, 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 less costly projects that could be also as, if, as effective. 
And I think the governance issue that, that you pointed out would be one of the main challenges that we need to address. And uh, as later, I will be I will mention a bit about our Penang Green Agenda report. The, the is it, this is an initiative carried out by PGC and a lot of you, a lot of the people, some of people in the audience were also involved, Professor, uh, including Professor Azazi, about giving some advice to the government recommendations. What what we can do, having a holistic approach, and whether or not we can do it. Uh, is important because it's a matter of life and death. As someone said in, pointed out in the chat box, what is a life and death matter? We cannot live without water. So it's about getting, pushing, up, pushing the water issue higher on the agenda. Whether the state should see I, I as a strategy. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, okay. So one uh, for part of the recommendations uh, from the water working group that we you know we gave to the government is maybe first of all make it a strategic or commodity. So we make water our strategic commodity, me meaning that everything else comes second. So when you talk about development, when you talk about what sort of uh, flood mitigation uh, 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 measures you will have, whether about you know cleaning up rivers, all these water comes first. So you need to think about how all these things will impact on water, whether enhancing it or whether depreciating it. So making water as a strategic commodity, strategic resource in, in, in instead will push some, will get some traction going. Secondly, I think uh, as picked up by you and as well as the water working group of PGA is we need to have a different type of governance, a governance structure that can uh, uh, allow the uh, state, uh, the states, uh, different agencies of the state to come together and make decisions uh, as, as a whole, not that you look at storm water, you only deal with storm water in your own way, and then you know you deal with water supply and that's it. So we need a holistic uh, view and holistic approach to, to do this. I think it's also very important is, in, apart from dealing with the supply side, Penang people need to really wake up and, and know to, and, and, and admit that we have a big problem with water. Water is cheap. Yes, it is a political issue, you know, PBA and a lot of agencies have asked for increase in water tariff. But, you know, things can't be done because of political issues. It's, it's sensitive. It is, you know, water is stable. Everyone needs water. But by not increasing the water tariff to a level where you can encourage uh, water saving behavior, you encourage new investment in new technologies or in installation of water saving devices and stuff like that you are jeopardizing a water supply in the long run. So I think public sh also shoulders a huge responsibility by using water in, in, in a sensible way so that we don't have to, the government doesn't have to think about all these different costly in investments in, 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 in uh, projects that will increase water supply. Anyway, thank you so much again, Professor Zazi, for your very insightful presentation and very passionate and at, 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 at times Funny but true. Sad funny. <laughs> <laughs> we need to laugh, you know. Otherwise, you need to cry. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, I can't I'm, agree I'm, more. You know, I'm, I'm set up this center for 20 years, you know. Until become the only center that very dominant, eminent in the country. So, mm -hmm. but people don't listen to me. So, now I have to go to UNESCO and telling Malaysia what to do now. I, I, I have no choice. Because when you are inside, nobody listen to you. That's why you need to go out and then selling <laughs> back, you know, uh, because this, this is the same thing. Because I tried this 20 years ago, and they still go for water transfer project rather than uh, the, the total solution for Kelang Valley. That's my proposal. I presented to EPU, and last of my, 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 my talk that day, this is Friday, I said, as the Warga of Malaysia, uh, I have happy that I managed to deliver this, this cadangan, so whatever you don't want to do or what not, doesn't matter because at least, you know, when I pass away, I have no question to answer. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Azazi. We respect that spirit of yours. And I think more people should have that uh, sort of passion and, and determination. I think. Yeah. And lastly, I, I, I just have two years to go. <laughs> I'm sure we'll see more of you, Professor Azazi. I don't think we'll let you go that easily. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, uh, Dr. Ahmad, so far, I think there are people obviously commenting on the lovely pictures and the cuteness and the not so cute, you know, uh, animals, but still very uh, valuable because they are endemic. They are our own Penang, you know, Penang animals. But we have two questions here. Uh, 
one is uh, you know it's it's about the stream crab. Can we eat that? Can we eat that crab? <laughs> I don't know whether it was asked in, in, in a jest or you know you were serious. And the second question is: Are, are the civets protected? You can eat them actually uh, if you want to eat, but then they're not big. They don't have a lot of flesh. You can. Uh, I don't know how many kilos that you need if you before you were able. The stream crabs they are just about uh, four to five cm wide. And most of them are just about yeah, about this yeah, three to four cm's. I don't know how many do you need before you'll be able to eat them. <laughs> yeah, but then if you eat, then that you lose your the the, the, the the you won't have the species anymore in Penang. Uh, but yeah, they're not to be eaten. Too small. Uh, number two, yeah, about the civets. Yep, they're protected. Uh, I know there are some sites having uh, issues with civets coming into making nests in your in houses yeah uh, you need to call the department of wildlife and national park for that to to handle that uh, and there are also people keeping civets as pets those are uh that's illegal uh, unless you get a special permit from the wildlife department okay that's great and i also see a posting by justine who is also from the habitat uh, foundation about the biosphere reserve uh, explaining what is being done and what's the processes, uh, what are processes. So apparently the uh, uh, the, propo the proposal for nominating Penang Hill UNESCO as UNESCO, the Penang Hill UNESCO Biosphere Reserve nomination has been submitted by the government of Malaysia this month. So it is a result yes. of, uh, of, uh, of many agencies, institutions, uh, you know, fed, uh, state agencies, federal agencies, and especially Penang Hill Corporation, and also private sectors like, like you guys. So you have proposed yep. to protect a huge area of our yep. terrestrial as well as our marine uh, area, um, yes. right, uh, areas. So let's see. And if we have that, it will be probably on par with UNESCO, or Georgetown, you know, uh, our heritage. Heritage yep, yep. So this will be the, the natural heritage. Yeah, so there is more of a reason for us to really celebrate about it. You know, tell everyone, tell all the Penang Knights that we have this. You know, we, we need to celebrate. So, so anyway, thank you so much. And I think, uh, I think those are the questions for you. Um, and if you have, in the audience, if you have any other questions, feel free to send it directly to Dr. Ahmad or send it to us, we'll yeah. forward to, to him. And I think there are two questions for PGC. I just want to answer very quickly. One is um, in terms of uh, tours, organizing tours to visit the valuable sites that we have, seagrass or, or hills. Uh, we do currently organize tours to visit how our waste is being dealt with and how our water is being treated You know, the, from, from the source to the end where the water comes out of the pipe. So we have these two types of tours that we do. Uh, in terms of touring the other areas, you know, in terms uh, related to biodiversity, I think why not? We can think about it. And, and given the MCO, maybe a virtual tour would be the answer. And I and also know, as I mentioned before, Habitat also does virtual tour, right? And a, f a few of us has participated, very, very intriguing, especially the yeah, the night one. So, so anyway, so the art tours are being done. And if there's, I guess, enough demand and also closer collaboration between PGC and, uh, the, you know, the out CMAX or Habitat, we can, why not? We can think about organizing these tours for the public. And second question from PGC is from Justin asking about the survey on single use plastic. Uh, oh, is in the chat. Okay, so, um, uh, um, unfortunately, it might sound like a standard uh, answer that you know we do want, you know when we don't like the question. But it is true. The person who has done this survey, who analyzed this survey, is not here today. I am so sorry. That is absolutely you know I'm not lying. We will get her to get back to you. You know anyone else who wants to learn more about this survey, uh, the result of the survey, we will send you a reply. So Justin, we def definitely get back to you regarding that. Anyone else who wants to know about that, we will also. Uh, uh, right to you. Uh, PGC has uh, done a lot on waste, uh, waste segregation, and no single-use plastic, uh, no plastic bag, no free plastic bags, and all this. There is an evolution of uh, projects and programs that we have on plastic. If you are, uh, you are willing to, you know, if you want to learn more about this, please get in touch with this. We will uh, let, let you know, explain to you the the whole sort of process. 
But yeah, that's it for, for, for this webinar. And since it's our last webinar, please spare me two more minutes to share some concluding thoughts. So we opened this series. This is last, the last, the fifth of our five part series on climate change in Penang. So we opened the series with a gloomy description of what, of how climate change is and will be impacting on Penang. So we talked about drought, we talked about floods, we have talked about sea level rise and, and Dr. Kam and, and, and we have various uh, panelists who share uh, some insights with us, right? So how these things will cause water, uh, food insecurity our security is not very high at the moment, but it will be even more secure when uh, we, we feel, of the more, uh, feel more of the impact of climate change. And it also threatens public health. So we talked about those in, in the previous uh, webinars. And we have to admit that this is Penang's inconvenient truth. So this is a truth that nobody likes, but it's not nevertheless truth. It is, this is not something that might happen. It is something that will happen. So the purpose of this webinar, webinar series, is to raise awareness. At the end, more importantly, is to generate conversations among the members of the public, among policymakers, among professional bodies, among businesses, oh, obviously, business community. And we hope that we have achieved our aim in pushing some of the agenda out there and raise some, some, some questions. And over the past few months, our panelists have shared with us what is likely to happen with our food and water security, and, and today, you know, uh, but also about protecting our biodiversity and also how we can better prepare ourselves by transitioning to a green economy and installing a better disaster management regime. And just bear, to bear in mind that dealing with climate change threats are not just a task of our government. It is our collective responsibility to protect ourselves, protect our well-being as well as our environment so that we can be more resilient. Of course, the government has to bear a, a lot of the responsibility and that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to you know, give recommendations to the government. And very importantly, we need, also need to do systemic change within the government, whether it is uh, governance, whether it is the SOPs, you know, a lot of things need to change before we can see huge changes on the ground. But nevertheless, we are starting on this journey that is worth uh, start, you know, uh, going, uh, starting. And under our Penang Green Agenda uh, 2030 initiative that I mentioned before, a uh, whole list of recommendations. So we set up 10 working groups uh, looking into areas, important areas that will, uh, uh, that are important for Penang to achieve sustainable development by 2030. So at least huge list of recommendations have been proposed to the government, including like what I mentioned in the water uh, issue, water working group, of what they can do and should do in terms of promoting sustainable development in Penang. And these reports are just, you know, uh, put on our website. The whole report, uh, the whole thing has been endorsed by the state government recently, and all the reports are now online. You can go to our website and, and, and look for them. At the individual level, there are a lot of things we can do, right? We talk about saving water, we should save energy, use less cars, you know, walk more, recycle our waste, use less plastic bags, and practice less wasteful consumption. And we can also urge, you know, make a strong case, you know, talk to our lawmakers, our representatives, our agents, and also our businesses. You know, we ask them to pay attention to the issue. We cannot afford to bury our heads in the sand. It, it doesn't just affect people living in big bungalows. It also uh, it definitely affect people who are in the B40. B40 groups are the ones that are gonna be impacted more so we really need to look out for uh, for this group and we need to make sure that you know our wishes to make penang a stronger and more resilient place are heard by our government and by our businesses we influence how businesses uh, uh, work by deciding how we're going to spend our money so if you don't agree with how business is run how it's impacting on the environment don't don't be that customer so you vote with your money Okay, uh, again, I would like to thank all of you who have joined us today and all of you who have joined us before in, in the previous uh, webinars and all our panelists who have shared valuable insights with us. And now that we know what we know and also because we care, we need to start taking actions. You know, in whatever capacity you're in, whether you are an engineer, whether you, will be, you are a teacher, whether you are a, a, a business owner, there are things that we can do. Right, to make sure that we live 
and more livable to our future generations. So it's not cliche. It does sound like cliche. It's not cliche. It is something that uh, that we really really need to seriously think about. And lastly, I would like to thank all my colleagues for their support here at PGC, and especially special thanks to my team members Mela, Navin, and Tang Tong. And this series would simply not happened without their help. And very very lastly, if any of you or your organization or institution would like to work with PGC to provide solutions to some of the is these issues, please feel free to get in touch on even just to understand some of these issues uh, 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 in, in more detail, please get in touch with us. Feel free to look at the reports online. Of course, re having the reports is just the first stage, first step. There are a lot more things we need to do. Like I said before, you know, uh, persuading policymakers, changing the system so policymakers can, can implement what they want, changing people's behavior, a lot, a lot of things that we need to do, but we see as a start of, of a journey. And, and also I would like to thank Dr. Kam just now, she said a link uh, about uh, eco-hydrology approach. So we're talking about rivers and, and uh, cleaning up rivers, protecting river ecosystem, as well as uh, providing uh, a fresh water supply uh, for, for Penang. Please take a look, it's in the chat, chat uh, group. So we are almost done, almost, almost done, I promise you. We just need to take group photo. So if all of you can turn on your uh, video, and when I will count one, two, three, three times. So by the time I say three, please give a big, big smile. Then my, my colleague here will take a picture of all of us. Yeah, are we ready? Can you please turn on all your videos? and we'll have a big family photo. Just almost there, almost there. Okay, we're still waiting for a few to turn on their video if possible. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna start counting. Okay, when I say three, please big smile. So I'm gonna do it three times, okay? One, two, three. Great, again, one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, last time, one last time. One, two, three. Great, perfect. Thank you so much for all your support, your comments, your feedback, and we look forward to working with most of you uh, in the future. And definitely, we you know Dr. Abe, Professor Zazi, Dr. Ahmad. We will come find you. Right? We, you know that we will not uh, stop bothering you. But anyway, thank you so much. And any feedback, you know, this this is uh, just to recap. This is the last of our uh, five se uh, five part series uh, webinar. We have a series on climate change in Penang. At the moment, there's no plan to have an, another uh, webinar series. But if you have any good idea of what we need uh, more, uh, please let us know when we will consider that. Thank you so much. Have a good day.